Good morning. Welcome to The Journey. My name is Jeremy Biedenbaugh, one of the pastors here on staff at Tower Grove. We're continuing on this morning in our uh, series, sermon series on worship, looking at the character of the God we worship. If you think about like worship service, one of the big elements of a worship service, right, is the preaching, the preaching of the Word and what God wants to show you this morning, as you heard Psalm 103, is he wants to teach you how to preach. And you say, that's the last thing I want to do is get up in front of people and talk. Or you say, I don't even particularly enjoy sermons myself, much less do I want to preach one, right? But see, there's something unique about this psalm. It only occurs in just a few of all the 150 psalms. And that is, it's not just a song. See, every psalm is a song. But this one, 103, is not just, a, not just a song, it's also a sermon. But not to a congregation, it's a sermon to himself. Do you hear him addressing himself in verses 1 and 2? He says, Bless the Lord, O my soul. Everything that is within me, bless his holy name. He's talking to himself. This is like a self-sermon, a self-talk. He's, he's saying, come on, soul, come on, everything that is within me. And so he's trying to say, let me show you, let me show us how to preach. And you say, well, I still don't quite get that. But let, let me just give you a definition of a sermon. Here's what a sermon is, just generally, not specifically Christian definition of a sermon, just what is a sermon? A sermon is a message intended to shape what you love and how you live. Just a message intended to shape what you love and how you live. If that's the definition of a sermon, guess what? You get, you get like a thousand sermons per week. You say, oh, I just come to church once a week and I hear a sermon but if a sermon is a message intended to shape what you love and how you, that, that's always from the time you wake up in the morning to when you go to bed, right? From Facebook, from Twitter, from your boss, from your friends, from your relatives, from, from uh, TV and commercials, messages are always coming at you and they're coming up from inside you too, right? There's this like inner dialogue. And so the psalmist, David, in Psalm 103 is saying, so, so to, to wade through those messages, all those other sermons coming at you, you need to know how to preach a sermon. You need to know how to preach the message of the gospel to yourself. There's a great quote on this. I'll, I'll probably quote it many times over the years, but Martin Lloyd-Jones, who's a pastor in London maybe 75 years ago, uh, he says this. He says, have you realized most of your unhappiness in life is due to the fact that you're listening to yourself, sermons, messages, instead of talking to yourself? You're listening to yourself instead of talking to yourself. And he says you have, to, you have to address yourself. You have to preach to yourself. You have to question yourself. That's exactly what he's doing in Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, everything in me. He's preaching to himself and he's showing us how to do it because he knows that, the, that, that we get a thousand sermons a week, that messages are always coming at us and they're coming from inside of us and they're usually saying things like, you have to go out and prove yourself. You have to go out and, and show yourself. You have to go out and be something, be someone, be valuable, show yourself to be significant. And this is just really, I mean, it's really prevalent all over our culture, so I'll just give you a couple quotes here. First quote being from the great theologian Madonna. She's a great one. But by, you know, by all accounts, Madonna's one of the most successful recording artist performers of all time, right? And here's what she said. This is an interview some years ago. She said, every time I accomplish something, I feel like a special human being. But after a little while, I feel mediocre and uninteresting again. After a little while, I feel mediocre and uninteresting again. And she said, I have to get myself past this. 
again and again, my drive in life is from the horrible fear of being mediocre. I have to prove I am somebody. Do you hear her? Do you hear the message that's coming at her? I have to prove, and not just this time, I have to prove it again and again and again and again. I'll give you a couple other quotes. If you've, if you've ever seen the, the, the great movie Chariots of Fire, Harold Abrams uh, in real life was one of the great uh, 100 meter runners of the 1930s. And uh, when he was asked, Harold, why do, why do you do this? Why do you give your life to this? Why do you run? He said, I have 10 seconds to justify my existence. 10 seconds to justify my existence. And then one more from my favorite movies of all time Rocky. Rocky Part One. Right? If you've ever seen the, the Rocky movies, you know that Rocky and Adrian are always fighting, like, why do you have to do it, Rocky? You know, and, and they're going back and forth. And, and so in the first one, you know, she's like, why do you have to do it? And he's like, because if that, if that bell rings, after the 15th round, if that bell rings and I'm still standing, then I'll know I'm not a bum. Now, it's funny, and it's also true. And it's true of us. It's, it's part of the, the inner and the outer messages, the sermons that are always coming at us. You feel like, I've got, I've got to, 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 to try and strive, and I've got to prove myself at work, and I've got to prove myself with this person. I'm always being controlled by these expectations because I don't know, you know how that person thinks about me or how that person feels, or I'm, I'm devastated inside because I want to be noticed by that guy, by that girl. Um, or, or if you do succeed and prove yourself, then you struggle with judgmentalism and condemnation looking down on other people. These messages are always coming at us. And so he says, you have to learn how to preach. You have to learn how to preach the gospel, the message of Jesus to yourself day in and day out, or else these messages will overtake you. And they'll become the guiding thing in your life. And he says, here's the key to that. Here's the key to that. Verse two, forget not. See it in verse two? He says, forget not all his benefits. The key, he says, is, is, is forget not. Just don't, just don't forget. You say, well, that sounds a little simple. Well, this is really all through the Bible. So you can see not just Psalm 103, but say like Isaiah 51. He says, you fear because you forget. In other words, he's saying, what he says in the verse is that you fear people, what they will say, what they will think, what they will do because you have forgotten the greatness and the graciousness of your God. He's coming back and saying, basically, most of your problems in life is be, are, are because you forget. And you say, well, I just sound, I remember, I believe in God. I'll, you know, I don't forget that. Part of the problem is the way we define forget, right? When we say forget, forget not, or we say remember, in our term, in, 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 in English, that just means uh, I had a mental lapse, right? I, I forgot to get the milk at the store. I forgot to, bring my, to get my keys. I, I left my keys. I forgot them. But what he's saying is, see, verse one, all that is within me, he's saying the, the core, your soul, the, the, the deepest part about you, the, the governing direction and disposition of your heart and mind and life, that's what you're remembering at the moment. That's what you're not, that's what you're forgetting not. So let me give you a little, little, little illustration of this because it's kind of maybe hard to grasp, but let me give you an illustration of what it means to have the, the center of your, your heart gri gripped and grasped by uh, a message, right? So back when I was in, uh, back when I was in high school, I, it was a girl that I wanted to go out with, and her best friend and my best friend were dating. They were going out, so it makes it pretty easy, right? So you just, they go out, they set us up on a double date, so we all go on a double date. It makes it nice and, nice and easy. So we did that. I told you I grew up in um, like middle of nowhere, South Carolina, so we have to drive like 45 minutes to get to Greenville, which is like the only place you can really do anything. And so we drive, we go to this fun park, you know, so they have like go-karts and batting cages and uh, arcade bumper cars and bowling and all this kind of stuff. And we get there, you know, like we're the gentlemen, so we're like, you know, ladies, what, what would you like to do? Which, which, what do you want to start with? And they say bowling. I'm like, okay, well, we can, we go bowling. And, uh, and I'm kind of thinking like when I was a kid, like I bowled a pretty good bit, like, like fifth, fifth, sixth grade. And so I was thinking I'm going to do pretty well and I'm going to impress her with my bowling, because that's what impresses women, right, if you're bowling? <laughs> Guys, please come to your dating advice for me. 
so we're getting, we're getting ready. We get all our stuff. We get on the lane, right? I'm the first one up, and I'm like, all right, I'm about to, you know, dominate this thing. And I'm just imagining myself just slinging this ball like 60 miles an hour down the lane, breaking pins in half, blowing up. And, and, and I get ready, take my steps, and I just sling the ball. Now, if you know anything about bowling, when you make that last step, what are those bowling shoes supposed to do? They're supposed to, like, slide. Well... There was a big giant thing of gum right on the bottom of my shoe. And so normally, you know, it would just kind of like throw you off, but because I was going so hard, it was more like Superman. And I'm talking about like licking the oil off the lane. First and last date with her. No, seriously, that was the last date with her. So why do I tell you an embarrassing story about myself? Well, because what do you think the message coming to me after that? When I saw her in the hall, when I thought about maybe asking out some other girl, what was the pervasive, dominant, governing image in my mind? You're an idiot. You're going to embarrass yourself again. The Superman, right? That, that's, what's, that's what's going through my mind. See, I haven't forgotten it. I didn't forget that memory, but it's no longer controlling. It's no longer governing me. And that's what happens with God. That's what happens with the gospel. We don't forget. We believe. We don't forget like some part of the message necessarily, but it, it stops being the controlling, governing image direction in our mind. So it's like we have, the God, we have God like on this old 1973 staticky walkie-talkie talking to us, and everything else is playing in HD. Everything else is going on high-res video. And, and he's saying, forget not, forget not, forget not. Get Make, make Jesus, make the gospel that central governing thing in your heart. And so he preaches this message, forget not, forget not, forget not. And the first thing he says, forget not the story of God. Forget not the story of God. And why do I say story? Well, stories are, we all like stories, they're powerful. But, but the deal is, is that every religion, every worldview has a story, has a narrative, has, it, it tells you some story. And, and, and every religion basically has the same storyline, which is God is out there, God is up there somewhere, so you should pursue him, you should go after him, you should, you should love him, you should obey him, you should do all the right things, and then, and then he will accept you and take you in, right? And you can see this, you just look anywhere. So the, the religion of Islam, is, is five, there's five pillars. You obey the five pillars, you do them right, you do them correctly, the holy God accepts you. Take something more like modern that we kind of turn into religion would be like a religion of career, right? You, you pay your dues, you do the right things, you get the right education, you, you make friends with the right people, you work really hard, and you will eventually achieve. You'll eventually get you know, what you've been seeking. So that's, a, that's the storyline of every religion, Except Christianity. Except Christianity. See what it says in verses 3 to 5? See what it says? It's talking about God. He forgives all your iniquity. He heals all your diseases. He redeems your life from the pit. He crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. And he satisfies you with good. The story of Christianity is differently because it says, you weren't running toward God, you're running away from God, and what did God do? You see, did you hear the verbs? Everything was a verb, everything there was an action, not your action, it was God's action. He redeems, he forgives, he pursues, he crowns, he satisfies. It was him pursuing and running after you. The story of Christianity is a story of God's pursuit of us, because he knows we could never pursue him. Every other religion says, the elite, the elite ascend the rungs of the ladder to get to God. But in Christianity, God descends the rungs of the ladder to get to you. He's a God who pursues, and when he gets to you, he's a God who rescues. You say, yeah, I, I, I get that. You talk about that a lot. It's part of the story of Jesus saved you from your sins. Yeah, I mean, that's... That's, that's, def, that's a huge part of it. Verse 3, he forgives all your iniquities. But it's so much more. There's this completeness. There's, there's this preaching to yourself that all of my life is getting, getting in front of God, getting that governing disposition of my heart and life at the gospel, right? See what it says? Let's read it again. You just think, listen, what are you, what are you struggling with today? You're struggling with guilt and shame? Verse 3. 
He forgives all your iniquity. You're struggling with suffering, pain, sickness. Verse 3. He heals all your diseases. What are you struggling with today? So with not getting any traction in life, feeling rejected, feeling abandoned. Verse 4. He redeems your life from the pit. What are you struggling with? You're struggling with dissatisfaction with life, with relational dysfunction. Verse 5. He satisfies you with good. That's how you preach to yourself as you let the text, you let the scripture wash over you and come over you. He's saying, what is it that's governing the, the central image, the central governing disposition and direction of your heart and life? Are you preaching that to yourself, that God's a God who pursues you and rescues you? And so he says, forget not the story of God. Forget not the story of God. But then he says, forget not the compassion of God. See, if you're struggling with something kind of big in life, you're, if there's something big going on, you're struggling with like injustice or, or pain or suffering or, or some issue you just can't quite figure out, a decision to make or whatever, like where, where, does your, where does your mind go? What's the image playing? What's the message that's coming? What's the sermon that's welling up in your heart? I'll tell you what it is for me. Whenever it's like that for me, this is, this is what I'm thinking. This is what I'm going through. And it, it's, it's something like this. The inner dialogue is, and why me? Who else has to do this? Who else has to face this? And I'm, the, I'm the only one that has to endure this. I'm the only one that has to think, that has to see this, that has to handle this, that has to make this decision. I'm the only one. And see, what it starts to do is to, is to, is to isolate, to push, push away. And that's when you have to bring the God, preach the gospel back. And you see what he, what he does is he, he says, forget not the compassion of God. Because God has a history of mercy. He says God has a history of mercy. Look at what he says in verses 6 and 7. He says, The Lord works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. You see, you see, you feel isolated? Go back to the record because God has a history of record, a history of mercy. He's put himself on the record historically, literally, really as a God who has mercy. You see what he says? All people. He says Moses. He says Israel, right? He brings back up. This is why it's so important to, to, to know the story of God, to know the scripture, to know church history because you, he looks at Moses and goes, hey, I'm not the only one. Right, remember the story of Moses? I mean, just, just briefly, like he, Moses was born in Egypt and, and there was a, a tyrant, a, a dictator named Pharaoh, or that was titled was Pharaoh, and said, all males born to Israelite children will be killed. And God saves Moses by having his mom create a little floating basket and send him down the river and he gets adopted into Pharaoh's household and he eventually leads God's people out of slavery uh, from Egypt. And, and, and he, you see what he's doing? He's going back to the historical record. God has a history of mercy. It's not just me. Guess what? My life is not nearly as hard or difficult. I've never had a, a, a tyrant con condemn my children to death or condemn me to death. So if God was able to take care of and show mercy and compassion to Moses, then he can do it for me. You go back to the record. God has a record from eternity past Never a promise broken. Never a promise unfulfilled. See, so many people will say, well, Christians talk about just believe in Jesus, just have faith. And I just, I don't know if I can do that. It doesn't make sense to me. Just like, just have faith, just trust somebody. God's not asking you to do that. What do I mean by that? Well, when do you know you can trust somebody in real life? Do you just walk up and meet random strangers who goes, trustworthy, hold my, hold my money for me? No. When someone has proven themselves over a history of time to be trustworthy, they have a record of it, then you know you can trust them. And God's saying, look at my record. Look at my record. The history of mercy. And so David starts to say, but, but so then if he has a history of mercy, who, who is this God? Who is the God that shows mercy to these people, that shows mercy to me? So i just ask you for a second. When I say God, when I say the word God, just think, what, 
What's coming on in your mind? What, what image? What emotion? What, what reaction? What, what's occurring? How do you see God? And what David does is goes back to Moses again, Exodus 34, when God says, I'll show you who I am, Moses. I'll show you the core of, of who I am. I'm not just a God who has a history of mercy. I'm a God who is mercy. Verses 8 to 10. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins or repay us according to our iniquities. See what he's saying? Go back. It's not just that God does mercy. God is mercy. It's the core of who he is. It's the governing part of his character. And he said, you've got to get God in front of you. You've got to preach this gospel. So you've got to have that playing on HD rather than the old staticky, walkie, talkie. And so how do you do that? Well, you just start, you, you preach it to yourself through inner dialogue. How do, what, what do I mean? Well, just look at the text. You say, who, who is God? You look at the text. You say to yourself, you preach to yourself, he's the Lord. He's a God merciful and gracious, abounding in steadfast love. And you say, well, but, but, but maybe, maybe God is angry with me for what I have done. Back to the text. He's a God slow to anger. So you name that lie and you come back to it. And you say, but, 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 but maybe there's nothing in me that God would care about me. He is a God merciful to the core, gracious to the core. And you say, but doesn't God only deal with like big, important people? He shows mercy to, keeps mercy for thousands. His steadfast love is from everlasting to everlasting, down to your children's children. You say, but, but I've sinned blatantly and abundantly and aboundingly. Yes, but he is a God, abounding, overflowing in steadfast love. You start to let that message wash over you. You start to preach it to yourself. You start to have this dialogue with yourself. Right? That's what he does. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, everything in me. Bless his holy name. And he starts working that sermon. And he says, so forget not the mercy of God and forget not the compassion of God. Forget not, forget not. See the compassion of God? See verse 11 and 12? He says, as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. And as far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. So you think about the quotes in the beginning. Like Harold Abrams, uh, 10 seconds to justify my existence. Rocky, uh, if I can win, I'll know I'm not a bum, Madonna. Uh, I have to prove myself over and over again. See, those, that's not just what they do, that's who they are. That's become their identity. And, and here's, the, here's the deal. At some point, Rocky's too old to fight, and Harold's too old to run, and Madonna's too old to sing. And then it's not just what will I do, it's who will I be. And what he's saying is, is what if you had an identity that wasn't shaped by that? What if you had an identity that was shaped by the God of the universe, the only one who really matters, the only person of real significance, saying, I accept you. You're welcome in my family. And you don't have to prove yourself to me. And that's why he says, forget not the compassion of God. Because it will shape your identity. He's saying, I can, God will remove your, your sins as far as the east is from the west. Why? Because Jesus purchased that. Because Jesus paid on the cross to remove your sins from east to west, to make God's steadfast love as high as the heavens to you and to me. And you know what Jesus is doing now? Like a lot of people, are, what, is he do, what is he doing now? Well, the Bible tells us in other places that he's doing this thing called interceding for us, which means praying for you, which means speaking to you, which means he's right beside the Father and has the Father's ear and he's talking to the Father. You know what he's saying? I mean, first, can you just imagine like, that Jesus, the King of the universe, is like talking about you and me? And the Bible says he's saying this, Father, see that one there. 
She's mine. Yes, she rebelled against you. Yes, every accusation against her is true, but I paid. See that one? He is mine. Everything, every accusation about him is true. But I paid. And I removed his sins as far as the east is from the west. What if your identity was shaped by that? Because whatever your identity, whatever that central governing thing, that, that, that image that's replaying on HD in your mind, whatever that is, that's what's shaping who you are, what you do, how you live. It was a really good movie that showed this like several years ago, five, six years ago. I don't know if you've ever seen a movie called Blood Diamond. And I don't necessarily recommend watching this kind of violent, but there's this great scene uh, in the movie. And, and what the whole movie is about is kind of like the diamond trade in Africa and and these warlords that, that come in and they, they, you know, kill and maim in order to get these diamonds and sell them on the market. And one thing they do is they come into villages and they'll ravage a village and they'll steal the children out of the village, like, you know, nine, ten-year-old. And they'll go and they'll make these kids part of their army. And the kids, they'll, they'll reshape their identity. They'll try to reshape everything about their identity to make them part of uh, the, the army that goes and fights for these diamonds. And the, the movie follows this one family, the Vendée family. And the army comes in and they steal uh, a Dia Vendée from his dad, Solomon, and they take him and they, they reshape him and they make Dia into a warrior. They make Dia into a fighter. They make Dia into a killer. And the whole movie is about Solomon going, trying to find his son, uh, seeking out his son and trying to win him back, trying to, trying to find him and then get him back into the, into the family. And uh, the, the kind of the, like the climactic scene of the movie, uh, they, they finally meet up, but, but Dia has this whole identity reshaped and he has this gun up trained on his dad and his dad's friend and you kind of expect Solomon to like freak out and be like no don't do it put the gun down you, you know but he does this amazing thing and he reminds him of his identity if you've ever seen a movie it's so powerful he looks his son in the eye and he says you are Dia Vende. you're a proud son of the Mende tribe your sister Nyanda is waiting for you at home. Your mother is making stew by the fire, looking for your arrival. The dog, Babu, only minds you, and he's waiting for you to come back. And he says, son, I know they made you do bad things. But you're not a bad boy. You're my son. I'm your father. And you're going to come home and live with me again. And when he's reminded of who he actually is, when that becomes the governing message in his mind, he drops his gun and he runs into the arms of his father and embraces him. That's why I was saying when God forgives your sin, it's not just some transaction out there on a ledger somewhere. It's actually shaping your identity and then creating a relationship with him. See verse 13 and 14? See the relationship? He says, as a father shows compassion to his children. See the father, the relationship. The Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame and he remembers that we are dust. He knows our frame and he remembers that we are dust. Now, that is such an odd thing because, do you see what he's saying? He says, he shows compassion to his children because, why? They're dust. Because they're weak, because they're sinful, because they're helpless. That doesn't make sense because I kept reading that and going like, but that's not, I don't understand that because I show compassion to people when they're nice to me. I show compassion when they do something for me. I like people when they, when they, when they achieve something uh, uh, good. But he says, my compassion comes to you when you show yourself to be dust. And it would make no sense except for the fact of the relationship. The relationship of father to son. And you think about it in that way, then it starts to make perfect sense. 
See, just a couple days ago, uh, my son, my oldest son, Jude, he's six years old, playing out in the backyard, and, uh, and he's on the monkey bars. We have this little jungle gym in our backyard. He's playing on the monkey bars, and he likes that. He's, his cousins were in town. He was showing his cousins how to do it. And uh, he got to the end, and normally he kind of like is able to hop over the little rail and then go, jump on the thing, go down the slide. But, but this time he, was, he got his foot, he, he tried to prop his foot, and it, and it, and it just shot through the, through the boards. And so, you know, the board's only about this far apart, and he got his, his foot stuck. And so he's trying to get his foot unstuck, but he's hanging on the monkey bars, and he then suddenly starts to realize, if I don't get my foot unstuck, I'm going to drop, and I'm going to fall and probably break my leg. And I'm not watching. I'm inside, so I don't know what's going on. But, but all of a sudden, when he gets in that situation, I mean, what do, you, what do you think he does? Daddy, 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 help, daddy, help. I look out the window and I see him and I realize that as soon as his fingers let go, he's drop and break his leg and just dangle. And so I said, oh, he's fine. He'll get out of it. <laughs> I said, I told you not to climb on those things. What are you doing? No, you know what I did. I saw him weak and needing help, but I just, and I ran out the door, and I grabbed him, I freed his foot, and I grabbed him, put him in my arms, and carried him down. It was his cry, his helplessness, his need that, that made my heart burst and run to him. And what he's saying about the Father's love, about this relationship with God, is that it's not just he says dutifully, I guess I have to deal with their sin. I guess I have to make way for their weakness. It's that very thing that makes his heart compel to you. It's an invitation to intimacy with him. It's that very thing that makes him run to you. So you might say, well, that sounds really good, but I've had a lot of relationships that started well, but they didn't finish well. They didn't endure. And so he's saying, but keep preaching them. Forget not, forget not, forget not, forget not, yes, the, 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 the compassion of God, but also forget not the endurance of God. Forget not the endurance of God. See what it says in verse 15 and 16. As for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field. The wind passes over and is gone, and its place knows it no more. It says the grass comes and goes, the flowers come and go. Everything we know in life is transitory. It's here one day, gone the next. And he says, actually, so are we. And, and what he says, that, the bottom line there is that, look, everything's forgotten. See, if the movie Chairs of Fire wasn't there, we probably wouldn't remember Harold Abrams. You know, one day uh, uh, we'll forget Rocky and forget Madonna. And that, that'll, everything will be forgotten. And those are the most famous people among us. So one day, like, everything I've done, everything, like, we have done, every, every achievement, every accomplishment, just one day it's going to be blown away like the, like the grass, like the flowers. Well, that's depressing. He says, unless you know the only one who is eternal. See verse 17, the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. It's not just that we forget, it's that God remembers, that God never forgets. He says his steadfast love is from everlasting to everlasting. It says Jesus not only pays, but he stays. All the way down, it says to your children's children. Everything else might be forgotten, but if you're united to me, if you're connected to me, then it says God will not forget you. God never forgets. You say, how do I get that in my life? How do I know that? How do I get that playing on HD? How do I get that out of the static walkie-talkie into the, the, the actual message of the gospel? And you have to see the central part of the sermon you need to preach to yourself, which is this. I said God never forgets, but there's actually one time in Scripture God does forget. There's one place in the Bible where God forgets. It's when Jesus went to the cross. Do you remember one of the things he said? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some translations, forgotten me. The word means forgotten. Why, my God, my God, why have you forgotten me? 
He's saying the central thing you need to get into your mind is to forget not when God forgot. Because he's saying he forgot his own son so that he could remember you. The son of God, the most intimate relationship ever to exist in the history between father and son from all eternity past, he forgot his son so he could remember you. And so when you see that, that will become the governing image, the governing thing playing on HD in your mind. It will start to shape your identity. All you are, all you do. And so you'll be able to bless the Lord. Oh, my soul, everything within me, bless his holy name. Forget not all his benefits. He forgives all my iniquities. He redeems my life from the pit. He crowns me with steadfast love. He satisfies me with good. All because he forgot his son so he could remember you. Forget not when God forgot. That is our identity. That is who we are in Christ. That's how we worship and live. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you were forgotten so that we could be remembered eternally. So I pray, Lord, that you would teach us to preach the gospel to ourselves. We're bombarded in our culture with messages from without and from within, all over the place, constantly telling us what to love and how to live. And I pray that those would be uh, back burner messages and that you would come And you would make the controlling, governing image, the governing disposition and direction of our heart and our life, the gospel of Jesus Christ that says, you are a God slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, who doesn't repay us according to our iniquities, but in fact removes our transgressions as far as the east is from the west. And you have done it because of the work and the life and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, amen.